within 60 days of coming back from Iraq, I put a loaded Beretta to my temple and pulled the trigger. Without the study, I'd probably be dead right now. We knew about therapeutic use of MDMA from the middle 70s, and just think about how many suicides would have been prevented, how much suffering would have been prevented. For a moment, it felt good that I existed, and I had no control over it. I think it's safe to say that the banning of psychedelic research is the greatest impotence to research since the Vatican banned the telescope in 1616. There's a quiet revolution going on in the world of mental health treatment. Illegal drugs previously associated with hippies, raves, and 70s rock records are being used to treat conditions like PTSD, depression, anxiety, addiction, and obsessive disorders. But there's a problem, and that problem is the war on drugs. The war on drugs not only means that scientists and doctors are being prevented from bringing out new treatments, but when people find themselves needing this sort of experience, they're forced to go underground and source drugs from the black market, meaning it's difficult to be sure about purity and dosage. And while many people are finding incredible value and healing in these practices, there's also a danger that the unregulated nature of the market means that patients might be looking for help from people who are perhaps less well-trained and scientifically informed than they should be. You have to be careful to be respectful in these and not take them. It's not a recreational ceremony. You're doing this to sort of surface certain things. Past trauma, childhood trauma, relationship stuff. Take you to the bathroom. When you're ready, you know what you So today we're going to share with you a beautiful preparation for the medicine that we've just taken. It's uh, breath work. It was something that was shown to me during a ceremony in Costa Rica when I was working with the Shabibo. I was communicating with the medicine, so I would like everybody to be touching, holding hands. And they might be crying, they might be screaming, there might be a whole range of stuff. We're opening ourselves up energetically, so there's a whole range of things that I've seen and that might happen. While scientists and activists are launching new campaigns, the twist, and perhaps the real tragedy of this story, is that this is actually not a new thing at all. The war on drugs has been blocking scientific research for as long as there's been a war on drugs. One of the great forgotten histories of modern medicine is that psychedelics were originally used by doctors to treat people, way before the hippies, the cops, or Pink Floyd ever got involved. The world first became aware of the power of LSD on the 19th of April, 1943, when Albert Hoffman, the scientist who first synthesized it, gave himself an experimental dose and tried to ride his bicycle home from the lab. The Swiss pharmaceutical company Sandoz marketed their new drug to researchers. And in the 1950s, doctors began seeing extraordinary results in treating alcoholism and depression. People who'd been drinking for decades were staying off booze for months and years after treatment. People with crushing anxiety and trauma were better able to integrate into daily life. In fact, Bill Wilson, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, even pushed for LSD to become part of the official AA program. But this was resisted by other leaders in the movement who demanded absolute abstinence. It's strange to imagine a world where people go to AA meetings in order to trip, but the evidence was overwhelming. LSD-assisted therapy was considered a way out of addiction, not towards it. Suddenly, Hollywood stars were lining up for private clinical sessions, with Cary Grant saying that this therapy was a rebirth that allowed him to accept his traumatic childhood. Then, in 1957, a major article appeared in Life magazine in which Robert Gordon Wasson, an ex-vice president of J.P. Morgan, described traveling to Mexico to participate in a ritual centered around sacred hallucinogenic fungi. The term magic mushroom was born. Albert Hoffman isolated the active compound, psilocybin, and a whole new branch of psychedelic research began. Well, I think the people who would benefit most of all are professors. Uh, and this, uh... I think it would be extremely good for almost anybody with uh, fixed ideas and with, uh, with a great certainty about what's what uh, to take this thing and to realize that the world he has constructed is by no means the only world. But then, in the early 1960s, Timothy Leary burst onto the scene. We tell young people today, drop out of school, because schools, education today, is the worst narcotic drug of all. Don't politic. Don't vote. These are old men's games. Impotent and senile old men that want to put you onto their uh, old chess games of war and power. Drop out. Uh, tune in with natural things. Leary is a contradictory character. He was a researcher at Harvard who did very serious, groundbreaking work. 
but he also courted publicity and had some pretty questionable medical ethics. When he got fired from Harvard, it caused a scandal that shook America into an LSD moral panic. Leary took this as an opportunity to coin his slogan, turn on, tune in, drop out. And the link between psychedelics and the counterculture was born. Acid and mushrooms quickly became associated with muddy, naked hippies mumbling about yellow custard dripping from a dead dog's eye. This, naturally, triggered Richard Nixon, who called Leary the most dangerous man in America. And in 1970, the Controlled Substances Act was passed, which placed psychedelics in Schedule 1 and effectively banned any further research. The sad thing is that very few people are doing this research because it's so difficult. Uh, and the that difficulty stems from the fact that all these drugs were put into Schedule 1 of the UN conventions, which in essence says they're very, very dangerous, which of course they're not. And they have no medical value, which is an insult, because before they were put into those conventions, they did have medical value and they still do have medical value. When we look at the MDMA studies of MAPS, uh, we see that there can be profound benefits in people with PTSD who have failed on conventional antidepressant medicines and also on CBT. They threw every pill imaginable at me. At one point I was on 42 pills a day between physical oh. and mental injuries. At that point, I would try anything, yeah. even something yeah. as crazy as ecstasy. What did you think when someone said, there's this MDMA therapy, this could be the thing that helps you? I was like, great, another thing for him to be hooked on and for him to try to kill himself with because he can't deal with what's going on in his head. And it completely changed his life. We're more used to thinking about MDMA like this. And there's like loads of drum and bass, loads of lights, and then everything was just like, whoa. Than this. I don't think I had seen a dead person until then. I'm just now coming to this. Thank you for what you're doing. Yeah. But in that study, using MDMA-assisted therapy to treat PTSD in veterans and first responders, 68% of patients no longer reported PTSD after treatment. This is a considerably higher success rate than traditional antidepressants. I'm a practicing psychotherapist, so I have a normal practice that I run on a day-to-day -day basis, occasionally with clients that uh, aren't able to get the resolution that they want out of their therapeutic work. I run uh, psychedelic therapy as well. And just whenever you're ready to ingest the psilocybin. When I was 18, I was diagnosed with uh, type 1 bipolar disorder. I'd just come off my psych meds for the first time and I met someone who introduced me to psychedelics in a way that I'd never experienced them before and I noticed that my mental health improved drastically. Studies with psilocybin-assisted therapy have been particularly successful for people with treatment-resistant depression, where all other methods have failed. Patients showed clinically significant improvement even six months after a single treatment. Other studies have shown 80% success rates in helping people quit smoking and major successes in helping alcoholics and people suffering with depression and eating disorders. Of course, traditional mental health medications can have immense value. They save lives and should never be discounted. But perhaps the main difference is that with psychedelics, it's not the chemical that's healing the patient, it's the patient themselves. It's thought that the medicine is simply helping them achieve a state where that is possible. We believe that the drug opens up people's minds so that they can be much more responsive to psychotherapy. They can get into places which their brain has not let them get into before. The constraints of, of this kind of operation is that I can't have any involvement with sourcing the substances or with advising the substances or anything like that. I can provide very general information on what kind of substances help in which kind of way, but it's ultimately about them finding what they want. Um, and hoping that it's a, it's a good positive chemical uh, to work with. The universities themselves are publicly funded and they're very uh, risk averse in terms of rocking the boat, I guess, or potentially risking their, uh, their public funding. The conditions under which psilocybin has to be held are more strict than those for heroin, cocaine or amphetamine, which are much more dangerous, much more sought after and much more addictive. In fact, there's no evidence that psilocybin is addictive at all. It, it's actually probably anti-addictive. But once it's in Schedule 1, very difficult to get out. Of course, plenty of people have used psychedelics without doctors just to have a good time and explore their consciousness. And it would probably be better if they were helped to make those moments as safe as possible rather than being criminalized. But losing 50 years of research into life-saving mental health treatments is one of the genuinely tragic and very little discussed consequences of the war on drugs. So the banning of these drugs was politically driven. 
it was supposedly to stop recreational use, which it didn't. But even if it had stopped recreational use, the denial of access of a proven therapy to millions of patients with chronic mental illnesses is horrific. It's the worst censorship of access of medicine to people who need it, probably in the history of the world. But there's a feeling that now the tide might be starting to turn. New research is starting all over the world, but at every step, progress is made much slower and more difficult by the law. Even at a time when there are an average of 18 suicides a day in the UK, and depression alone costs the economy 10 billion pounds a year. In the US, over 19% of adults report experiencing mental illness, and globally, over $17 billion a year are spent on antidepressants. There's probably no greater proof of the desperate need for this research than the explosion of people seeking out their own therapeutic psychedelic experiences. What kind of people come to your door asking for DMT? Everyone who you can think of, moms, dads, a lot of young people, professionals, blue collar people. I've been able to share it with Silicon Valley people, artists from um, Industrial Light and Magic, Apple engineers, Google engineers. I can't even describe all the titles. Everybody wants to try the spirit molecule. That was amazing. It's a shame that people seeking mental health support in this way are so often forced into breaking the law. But at least when it comes to psychedelic medicines, there may be some hope that we're starting to see the light. We'd like to congratulate drugs for winning the war on drugs. 